Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is my colleague, Dr. Vanessa Druskett, Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior and Management here at the University of New Hampshire. Vanessa studies and teaches about team emotional intelligence, helping organizations develop more effective norms and behaviors. In the full version of the interview, we go through Vanessa's intellectual journey from an early interest in social work to work on leadership, teams, and emotional intelligence. We talk in detail about a few of her papers, particularly a Harvard Business Review paper she co-authored called Building the Emotional Intelligence of Teams, which has been cited over a thousand times. I have included a ungated version in the show notes. You can click through there and download it for free and follow along if you'd like with the conversation. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Vanessa. And if you do, won't you leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you might be listening to this podcast. It helps other people find us. Thanks for listening. And here is Dr. Vanessa Druskett. Welcome to the podcast, Vanessa. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here with you and your listeners. I want to start with your academic journey and your education. So you started out, got a BA in psychology at Indiana University. Mm -hmm. What drew you to psychology? Well, actually, I started out, I, I grew up in Massachusetts, and I decided I was interested in social work. And there are very few schools that had social work as an undergraduate major. Um, one of them was Boston University, which is, uh, you'll see that's pre for later, but the other one was Indiana University. So I picked Indiana, went down and started studying social work and decided that it wasn't for me. I, I was too opinionated. Okay. <laughs> the idea was that I was going to have to go in and not take all my liberal values and all my values. And I was going to have to go in and work with people and not be, not be, not have a values, my values orientation get in the way. And so I was at a loss for what to do. My roommate said, let's become business majors. I said, sure. Well, okay. Yes. So um, I became a business major for a semester and that's what introduced me introduced me to organizational uh, psychology, organizational behavior. So, uh, just to, to give you that um, lead, um, I hated business again. Once again, oh. my <laughs> values got in the way. <laughs> I went from a three nine GPA to two four or something like this in one semester. Oh wow! I hated classes. Okay. Um, so anyway, at the time I was taking psychology courses, I started taking more and I fell in love with psychology, but never, I could never see myself doing clinical psychology because it was way too similar to the social work issue. Right. But since I now had the business minor, I could see, you know, marrying psychology with the workplace. And so that was, that's what I ended up getting interested in. Okay. So you went um, from Indiana to Columbia, where you earned a master's in organizational psychology. Was that right away, or did you have some work time in between? I did a lot of things in between. I traveled. Okay. I was a ski bum for, for a while. Um, and, yeah. But one of the things that becomes really important is during my journey at that time, um, I had, I worked, well, in my lifetime at this point, 31 different jobs. Wow. So I, and I'm not talking about different consulting jobs. I would consider consulting one job, right? But I was, I was an explorer. I was always a little bit of an explorer and I traveled and I worked in different places. For example, I worked on a kibbutz in Israel and I was working in the laundry that for four months, that was one of my jobs. Um, and so I got kind of a, a really good sense of who I was in relation to these different jobs. And what I found was that every job I had, I was a little bit of a different person. So there was something about the context that either turned me on and got me engaged and I was a great employee or something that alienated me and I just wasn't that engaged. And so I got back from traveling, always knowing I was going to go on in school and decided that I was going to follow that business, that, that interest, the marrying between psychology and business 
And specifically, I got interested in group dynamics. I started thinking about group cultures or team cultures based on the, the different places I've worked. And so I went to, yeah. I picked Teachers College, Columbia Teachers College, because it had some group dynamics information there. And I had some really good, really good faculty at the time and uh, moved to New York. And that was fun. So it was a good, okay. great experience there. Great experience. And were you thinking at that point, were you thinking, I'm going to go on, get a PhD, become an academic? Or were you thinking, I don't know, stop at the master's and maybe become a consultant or something like that? I always thought I'd go on, uh, but I wasn't quite sure. I was going to see what happened. But I did get involved in research at Teachers College, okay. and I did a bunch okay. of research, fascinating research with some of the faculty there, and that really launched me. Um, at the time, I met my husband, and he was in Boston, and so I couldn't I couldn't stay on. I decided not to stay on at, at Teachers College, but I had to go back to Boston if I was going to go on. And so I took a year kind of moving back to Boston with him and then went back to for the doctorate a year later. Okay. And you did the doctorate at Boston University. Yes. Um, yes. And, and at, at that point, um, social psychology. So what is the field of social psychology? Okay. So first let me say a, a tough question for me was, do I go into social psychology or do I go into a business school? Okay. And everybody said to me, look, all the theories are in psychology. Business is just stealing the great theories or organizational behavior is stealing the great theories. So get grounded in the, in, in the theories within psychology. And at the time, Boston University also had an amazing OB department and it still does. Um, yeah. And so um, I decided social psychology basically is the study of how the situation impacts behavior. All right. So this is, again, com comes back to my interest in why I was so different in all these situations. Yeah, Here's Vanessa, yeah. you know. She goes from one job as the as the in the laundry at, at the kibbutz, and she's on fire, yeah. and I'm so good at it. They leave me alone and let me run the laundry all on my own, you know. Uh, oh, to another jobs where I just couldn't didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And I thought yeah. that a lot of it was the situation, the situation with the people, the way they treated me, the way they appreciated me, the way I got to have some control. Um, and so all were, all were things that I picked up on later in my, in my future research. Um, and I wanted to delve into the situation. And so I picked social psychology. You know, it's fu funny that you said that because um, I had a kind of, kind of similar experience. I, when I was doing my MBA um, and I got, uh, I had transitioned from being a philosophy major to being a, a to into business, and I was at my MBA. And the thing that I really liked about the business school was how um, they stole from everybody. Yes. Uh, to me, that that seemed like a cool thing actually. Yes. And I kind of, I thought I would go. That's I, I thought that would be my you know that I would wind up doing a, a PhD in business. I wound up doing economics, which kind of steals from everybody too, but yeah. um, in a different way. Uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, let me say that's why I teach in a business school now. The yeah. college yeah, right. too narrow. Whereas the business school was okay. just come on, any any theories, any you know, we're really interested in the outcome. And and that right. was that was what was exciting to me. You know, what were you how yeah. you how you Im influence the business world or the people in the business world? Right. Yeah, yeah. So did you have this idea that you wanted to I mean, you saw how the environment changed you and how you interact with the environment, did you have an idea that um, you maybe wanted to help people figure that out or change it? Or what was your, what were, what were your kind of thinking? Like, what do I want to do with this at that time? Yeah. At that time, I, I hadn't yet come to that conclusion. I was just so mm -hmm. in love with psychology, with applying psychology to the workplace I was so in love with every class I took at, at um, Teachers College. Uh, I was just enamored with the whole thing. And I, for me at the time, I knew I was interested in group dynamics. By the way, when I was at Teachers College, I got an A in every course except for my group dynamics course, which I got a B. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Again, too opinionated. I had too many, you know, didn't quite fit what they were, what the teacher was thinking. Um, but still, that was that was my my love coming out of that. My essay to get into the doctoral program was all about group dynamics. But I was very oh. open minded about what I would what I would look at within that realm. 
That's neat. Well, so I want to talk about, I've got a couple of papers that, that I've pulled um, that I, I mentioned to you before we got started that I've, I, I've pulled that you'd written, um, one of which must have been one of your earliest papers, mm -hmm. the 1994 piece, uh, Gender and Leadership Style, Transformational and Transactional Leadership in the Roman Catholic Church. This must have been something, was this something you were working on in your PhD or did you do it shortly afterward? This was, I had the opportunity to work with a faculty member at Boston University who was a former priest, and he received a huge grant from the Lilly Foundation to study um, um, the Catholic Church, essentially, and especially of uh, the schools and the hospitals and the churches and, and the leadership within the Catholic Church and, and all those places. And so he pulled me in to help him with that. It was, uh, you know, I got some funding from it. And one of his interests was in transformational leadership. And so he had thrown in to his survey um, lots of questions about transformational leadership. So I took an interest in that area and that's what, that was the impetus of that, of that paper. Okay. So talk about, so transformational leadership, I think comes out of the eighties. Yeah. I mean, I know the, pre, the, the, the precedents were probably date back into the fifties and I don't know, X and theory X and theory Y and all that kind of, kind of stuff. Kind of, but yeah, it was like the, it, the t term was coined like in the eighties, right? Yes. So, yes. It, they're about, so it's still a relatively new idea. Yes. It's still hot right now. It is a very okay. hot idea. It's continued to be hot. The idea is that leadership is about change. And so uh, transformational uh, leadership theory basically says leadership and change are synonymous. You know, you don't go into a leadership role and say, oh, status quo is fine. You go in with the idea of transforming the organization. But the theory says that in order to do that, you have to really inspire people. You have to get to know them individually. You have to touch them individually. Um, convince people that they need to do more than they think that they can possibly do. And so um, you... You get to know people and it's got a lot of, you know, sort of OB, a lot of values that are consistent with my own, you know, these values that got in my way when I was studying social work. <laughs> um, but it's just, a, it's a really brilliant theory. And so I fell in love with the theory. And then what I found, I think, uh -huh. I don't know if you want me to talk about. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, let's go. talk. I mean, you go. Let me uh, let me throw a couple of thoughts out there. One is you did this huge survey. You had, I think you you had um, uh, something like eight over eight thousand responses. Yeah. So this is really robust. Yes, and by the way, I was um, in that in that um, grant I, that I was part of. Someone had to call all those people and make sure that the uh, response rate was high. <laughs> and I was one of the doobies on the phone getting that helping get oh, that resp gosh. response rate. And you know the basics of research when you're a graduate student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paying your dues. Paying your okay. Dues, right. Yeah. So, all right. So you studied. Um, uh, so you studied. Uh, 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 I think this one specifically drew on to uh, all male and all female orders. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so let's talk about about kind of how you got. You know, what were you looking for, and what did you actually find? Um. Well, we. You know, these these. Um, Nuns run the schools and a lot of the hospitals, and priests run a lot of boys' schools and 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 um, churches, and um, you know they don't mix all that much. And so we were able to really look at how the followers, or you know the I don't, I don't know what you want to call it. We can't really call them employees, but you know you've got your leaders and your followers. How the followers sure. of these leaders of these organizations rated their 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 leaders, and whether or not they rated them to be transformational and inspirational, and you know, inspiring them to, to people to go on to do more than they ever thought they could do, or whether they were simply what we we call transactional leaders, which is that mm -hmm. you do this, I'll do that for you. You know, basically leadership as a transaction, which is get this done and then we'll promote you to that, you know, as opposed to inspiring. And what we found was huge, significant difference that the women were much more transformational than, than the men. And that was quite controversial at the time. You know, a lot of uh -huh. um, research had been coming out about, you know, Hey, women can be leaders too. There's women's ways of knowing. And, um, you know, women's are, women are different, but they can also be good leaders. And so it was kind of uh, at the edge of, of that period of time where 
there was a lot being written about whatever happened to women leaders. Right? Okay. And so I, I think one of the, one of the surprises that I took away that I think you, one of the things that surprised you, I think as well from reading the article was that um, there was more transformational leadership kind of between both men and women than you, I think you expected. Yes. But even so, women showed more transformational leadership than, than men. Yes. Thanks for reminding me of that. The only thing that I remember really yeah. was that, yeah. Was yeah, yeah. So it was only yeah. what thirty-five years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thirty. Well, I think you would expect it. Yeah, you'd expect it within the Catholic <laughs> Church. There's a lot of re reason for inspiration, right? Right. Sure. I mean, people are people presumably are in these organizations because they, you know, are inspired or want to be inspired, yes. right? Yes. To do what they do. So, uh, one of the things you talked about in the article, I thought was interesting, and you kind of just raised it a second ago, is about the industry's perspective on women and women in leadership roles. And one of the things you, you discussed and I, uh, in the article I thought was interesting was, um, you know, women in, in mixed, uh, gender, um, organizations might have less power because of their status as women, but this study controls for that. Yes. Yeah. And so, and so, you one argument could be well women show more transformational leadership when they're in mixed gender environments um because they don't have as much they can't draw on as power a power base that would allow them to be transactional yes. i think is that is that the correct yes absolutely absolutely okay. i mean i would i would say that that's true today too you know okay. it continues to be true i think yeah but but the conclusion of the paper really is women just do it more, even when they're, I mean, this is the interest I think is kind of one of the interesting things is about that paper was even when it was an all women um, organization, they still, uh, uh, still engaged in more transformational leadership than their male counterparts. Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's interesting to think about transformational leadership as being sort of a feminine way of leading, you know? Um, so it's, it's basically getting to know people um, helping them to develop, right? Um, and it's um, it, it just feels a little, you know, you want you you you, you talked about theory X, theory Y. I mean, it feels mm -hmm. very theory Y. And I started really thinking about it as I started delving into a lot of the, the literature on what differentiates men from women's values and things like that. And and you know, nobody had ever really talked about how this transformational leadership theory that was touted as so great really was consistent with women's values. And so that, that um, was an epiphany for me. And, and okay. yeah. And so the paper continues to get cited quite often, uh, yeah. which is, which I guess I think, you know, it's, it's, it's attractive to people who are interested in, in religion and people who are interested in, in, in gender issues in general. So. Yeah. But let me say one more so, thing about the paper. Yeah, it probably wouldn't have been a solo authored paper, but what happened was at the time, I saw my my supervisor David Nigren, who was the faculty member, um, who was the priest that was leading all this, found something that was an um, a, 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 a kind of a competition at the Center for Creative Leadership, and it was a competition of of graduate students. Um, graduate student written papers on leadership. So he encouraged me to finish up the paper. It forced me to finish it quickly and to submit it uh, for that award. And I got the award. So oh, I came in first place for this graduate student um, uh, award at the Center for Creative Leadership. I got to fly out to to that think tank and present the paper. And in retrospect, I really, if it really feels badly that David Nigren wasn't the co-author on that since he was the PI on this, on this. So it really should have been, you know, I had a lot of um, support from him, uh, but it, it really kind of launched my career being able to have that, that award and the context I made through it and things like that. And, well, that's great. Yeah. And it, and it taught me a lot so I, since I did have to write the paper on my own. So. That was one of the stipulations. Yeah. yeah. Well, as I read that paper, it struck me that, and I said this to you a minute ago uh, before we got started, um, it struck me that I could see, you know, doing my little retrospective look at, at your, at your, you know, uh, intellectual career that you could see the germs of kind of a lot of what you did after. 
both in terms of kind of leadership and specifically self-managing teams, and also this kind of the importance of emotional intelligence, which in, in and emotionally intelligent teams, which we'll come to in a minute. So through the '90s, I, I saw in your in your publications that you did a lot with self-managing teams. So how did the self-managing teams theme? How did you get involved in that? Um, and how does that? How was that kind of an outgrowth of what you'd been doing at BU? Okay, so you know, I, I went in there knowing I was interested in teams, but ha- trying to figure out well, what what was I going to do with my um, with my dissertation. And we had the good fortune to be connected with Polaroid, which was in Cambridge and um, which was, you know, very close to Boston University. And they had um, created self-managing teams at Polaroid. And so we had a representative come in and talk to one of my classes on group dynamics. It was talking all about um, self-managing teams. And it just clicked. I mean, he basically said, look, we have these people on the shop floors um, in self-managing teams, they no longer have to ask permission to use the restroom. They can decide on their own. Okay. So all of this just hit me like, what? They don't have permission? <laughs> <laughs> so all of my, you know, um, social justice, uh, stuff all came in and, um, and I just, I just fell in love with that idea. And so that, that became a big interest at that time. And I, okay. Yeah. So talk talk about a self-managing team a little more. Aside from being able to decide when you want to go to the bathroom, what's the difference between a self-managing team and a and a, I guess a traditional team, if if that's the right word. So a traditional team has a leader on it, and the leader um, can be as um, hierarchical and controlling, or as you know empowering as they want. But primarily, um, the leader runs the ship. You know, um, and so. The team members do what the leader wants, right? Uh, but self-managing team basically said, uh, the, the philosophy is, why do you need a leader? If you can get them to interact, and these are smart people to begin with, that know, that know um, the work, um, if we put them in self-managing teams where they share leadership, and typically the teams, especially the teams that I started studying for my dissertation, they would rotate this position of kind of facilitator, right? And so you would always have somebody who was you know, filling out the schedule and doing kind of the paperwork for the team, but it would rotate or, you know, six, whether it rotate weekly or every six months. Um, And then you wouldn't have to have someone telling you when to do things and you could decide things on your own. And so it obviously cut out a layer of, of management. So it was, you know, economically uh, feasible. You'd have one leader in charge of, you know, say 10 teams. Right. And so you would still report to someone, but the teams were, were, were semi-autonomous, you know. Um, okay. okay. And that's the idea. You still always have, have a leader. So that, that's the idea, essentially. How, how popular is this idea? I mean, like I've read about Gore and some other organizations, but I'm curious, how popular is this idea out in the world based on, based on your research? Okay. Um, well, it's, it, it waxes and wanes, all right? At the time, you know, I did my literature review for my dissertation on it, and there had been pockets of places. Gaines Dog Food had done it for a while. Um, there had been uh, over in the UK, they had done it in um, mining teams. Um, and it was always really successful. Motivation went up, you know, uh, team, team members loved it. But then it would last for a while, and then a new leader would come in and say, I don't want to work this way. So it was always, you know, at the behest of whoever was running the ship at the time could decide whether they were going to keep it or trash it, whether they were willing to share control or wanted control. And so a a lot of it really depended on that. And so my dissertation, basically, the whole literature review basically said, look, it's a great idea. By all accounts, it works well. All the studies that have been done on it show, but don't count on leaders to continue to support it, <laughs> which is essentially what happened at the plant where I where I worked. It happens all the time. So we're it's waxing and waning. Right now, it's coming back under a new term, which is called shared leadership, which is a okay. very big deal right now. Um, and people are trying to figure out, well, what exactly is that? But the, it, it always comes down to how much control management really wants to give to the people that they're um, uh, responsible for. Okay. Um, how much do you, I, I saw some references to self-leadership, Charles, Chuck Mann's yeah. uh, work. How much do you do with 
how, how important is that literature in understanding effective uh, team, uh, self-managing teams? So kind of, yeah. Yeah. Is the, is the self-leadership piece important in understanding how it, uh, uh, how it, how a team then is able to build on those units or is there, or can you deal with it at the more macro team level? So, you know, Chuck Mance was one of the first people to start studying um, self-managing teams. Um, and he got very interested in the, in the idea of self-leadership matting, mattering, excuse me, in self-managing teams. But you have to remember that I took a social psychological lens to teams. And so my idea was always what matters more is the culture you create in the team than in the skills you develop in any one individual. So my idea was, you know, coming back to my own self, you know, I was a, a perfectly capable individual with a lot of different skills, but in some environments I'd use them and in some environments I wouldn't. So uh, okay. that's, so my lens was just very different. So I did never, I never used Chuck Mann's, uh, I'm sure I referred to it. It was very popular for a while. And of course his research, you know, he was a real, um, a starter, you know, like a led a new movement. I felt. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was also one of my professors from when I did my oh, MBA. Oh, yes, so that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great he's been at UMass yeah. Amherst now for, for yeah. ages. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, what did you learn that made self managing teams effective? Yeah. So, uh, just slight background. I went for my dissertation to a plant that had three hundred self managing work teams. And I studied the teams there and I went down and, and basically lived with these teams for two months and then came back a few times after I did my, my, my collection over time. And I collected all kinds of information from them. Um, but primarily what I, what I ended up using for my dissertation was this, this information about the norms, the, the culture that the team would develop. So some teams would just develop a culture, okay? They'd have rules that sort of engaged them. Um, so let me give you an example. One rule was focused on for sort of feedback and team, what I called team self-evaluation. So periodically they'd step back and they'd say, okay, how are we doing? What needs to be tweaked? You know, this kind of thing. Another rule that ended up being really powerful was they actually got to know each other at a level so they could predict one another's behavior. So, um, they would say, well, you're not going to want to do this. You're going to want to do that. You know, and so they didn't, they, they knew each other at this level. And some teams just didn't have those kind of roles. They, they didn't know each other. They never stepped back and looked at. And so what I found um, was in the end, a set of norms that I felt differentiated those teams that were really great from those teams that were not so great. And that, that was the outcome of my dissertation. By the way, another thing that affected my dissertation was that I had handed my survey data, most of my survey data, over to a company that was going to be scanning. It was like early, early in the scanning technology, right? We used to have to enter the data one by one every survey, right. every time. Right. And I gave it to the scanning, and they lost the data. Oh they my moved God. off this, <laughs> and they lost the data. You cannot believe it. Oh. So oh. <laughs> I think I was the first graduate in a psychology department that was pri that produced a dissertation that was primarily qualitative. I did have some surveys. Um, there was one survey in particular that I uh, did not use scanning technology for that I had. But anyway, that's a whole other story. So it was a wow. panic moment. Oh my god! Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> but so anyway, it, it ended up being great data, and I delved in, and, and it was fascinating to look at. Um, interview. I, yeah. I did three-hour interviews, individuals with teams, you know, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I, I just as kind of an aside, what kind of, do you see yourself as a qualitative researcher or a primarily a quantitative researcher at this point? What, how do you, how do you approach problems or do you do, do you do a little bit of both? Do you dabble in both? I dabble in both, but I prefer qualitative research. So that kind of set me on. I mean, I'd never taken a, a, a course in qualitative research, but that's what I had. I had to figure it out on the fly. Um, I just love the richness of it. And so I do yeah. both. I've done both, you know, but I, I, I really feel like you can dig deeply and hear the stories that, um, that you know, that aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I'm, I'm the same. So I, I, I think, you know, so, um, so, 
what I, the, some of the, the things you're talking about with the, you know, getting to know people, this is where that, that resonates back to the transformational leadership that you talked about. Yeah. Right. Um, and it kind of leads to the other stream of your research, which is more in the emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence resident at the team level. Mm -hmm. Did you, so E, e I, E, Q, uh, emotional quotient, those also are kind of buzzwords out of the 80s, right? Um, I mean, that, was it 90s. 90s? That was actually early 90s, right? Goldman published his big uh, popular book in the 90s. But that research had been going on in one shape or another for, for a while. Not really. First paper, okay. I think, the first academic paper uh, was published by um, Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer. Jack Mayer is in the psychology department here at UN. Right, you know? yeah. Yep. Um, and Peter yep. Salovey, uh, he was doing a postdoc with Peter Salovey at, at Yale. And Peter Salovey was, at the time, was famous for his research on on envy, jealousy, things like that. So he was in emotion research. Um, but 1991, I think, was the first year that, that their first paper came out okay. on that. Okay. So, okay. yeah. So when did you become aware of that? Okay, good question. That, Great question. Yeah, and how, does, how did that, how did you kind of make that link between emotional intelligence and transformational leadership, which you had already been working with. Sure. sure. So um, when I was in graduate school, I, you know, I was so interested in teams that I did, took, took a bunch of, um, well, first of all, I took some clinical psychology courses on um, group therapy since I was in the psych department, but I also um, took a two year program with a, a, a educational institution called national training laboratories. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm not. Okay. So they are quite famous um, for training people in, you know, basically psychology of groups. And they use what's called T-group methodology, where you put people in a group. Okay. And, you know, um, and, and there are, it's, it's one way of, of, for people to sort of learn about themselves relative to groups. There are three main traditions in that. There's the Tavistock method, which is big with, um, in the United Kingdom. There's the Gestalt method, which was um, when I was in Cleveland, I was able to learn the Gestalt method. But um, National Tra Training Laboratories, which is out of Maine, has this T-group methodology. So anyway, long story short, it put you in a group and you, you study the group and you study each other. You study how the group culture emerges. And okay. what I learned in that was that the primary way to find out what the issues were in a group um, was to pay attention to the emotion on people's faces. So I did a two-year program with them. And basically, um, what I learned was anything you wanted to know about a group was in the emotion that you were catching from the others in the group. You know, emotion is contagious. You could see it on okay. the faces. You could, so people's frustration, okay, what are they frustrated about? So all, everything you needed to know about facilitating a group or what the problems currently were would emerge out of the emotion that was being experienced by group members and that was contagious within the group. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm right. Uh -huh. It does, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's where I yeah. first learned about the power of emotion in groups. <laughs> It's powerful, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, so then how did you tie that to leadership um, and take it to that next level? Sure, sure. So I had been talking about emotion in groups and, you know, writing about my, my self-managing team stuff. And I was at Case Western Reserve for eight years where Richard Boyatzis is. I don't know if you recognize that name. He's one of the authors. I recognize, but I don't. Yeah. Know. So he's one of the authors in emotional intelligence. He was um, Daniel Goleman's roommate at Harvard during their PhD program. Oh, that's neat. Yep. Okay. And furthermore, the reason I got to know uh, Richard Boyatzis is because Richard Boyatzis, Daniel Goleman, and and I all had the same mentor. Um, we all studied under David McClelland. They had studied at, at Harvard, and Harvard had required McClelland to retire at a certain age, and McClelland came over to Boston University where I was. And so he <laughs> was cool. my dissertation chair. And so we, we all knew each other through that connection. And so they, when they, they were writing a book on you know, it was, a, it was an edited book, and they wanted someone to write a chapter on emotional intelligence in teams. They asked me to do that, 
And that's how that started to emerge. I, I contacted my, a good friend of mine from um, graduate school, Stephen Wolf, and we wrote a book chapter on what would an emotionally intelligent team look like? Okay. Well, let me, let me ask you a little bit about, to talk a little bit about emotional intelligence uh, as a construct first, and then, and then we can, and hopefully this, this actually makes sense this time to go from, from individual emotional intelligence to group emotional intelligence, or do you, or, or am I getting that wrong? Like I did with self-leadership and self-leading teams? No. Do you think there's a connection? So in that case, you do see scaling kind of important. But again, I come back to norms rather than individuals. So I, rather than looking at individual emotional intelligence, which I'll explain in a second, rather than that building yeah. an emotionally intelligent team, I look at how do you create an emotionally intelligent culture? Okay. Okay. And so that's, yeah. that's what's different. Um, well, let's talk about emotional okay. intelligence let's for a minute because that is of interest to leaders, and in, I think in general. And and then let's talk about how that kind of all fits together with your larger theory. Yeah, so it's a it's a complicated um, topic that it's hard to say in a soundbite, but I'll do my best. Um, basically, the idea is that our brain is. Um, I'll explain it the way that um, I, who's that guy that I always talk about all the time. I can't think of his name. The Nobel Prize winner. You think of Kahneman? Kahneman. Kahneman. Yeah, Dan Kahneman. Dan I love that. Kahneman. He's, okay. he's just amazing. Yeah. He talks about system one, system two. This is what I like to talk right. about because it's illogical. System one essentially is our old brain. It's really the bottom of the brain. Some people talk about left, right, but it's really the bottom of the brain, close to the brainstem. It was the first part of the brain to evolve, and it picks up everything from emotion. So we didn't have, you know, verbal cortex in those days. We didn't have language. Everything came from instinct and emotion, all right? Um, and then our ancestors developed what we call the prefrontal cortex, which is the analytical part of the brain, which is how we solve math problems and we're logical thinkers and things like that. But what a little known fact is that the emotion part of the brain never shuts off. And so we used to think that they were two different things. Leave your emotion at the door. You're not going to use your, your logical brain. Turns out that that's just not true. We never turn off the emotion part of the brain. And so, but what the emotion part of the brain does is it provides us with valuable information about the social situation or the situation in general. All right. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it works super fast. Our, the emotion part of our brain takes in, and, and I'm going to say this slowly because it's going to be shocking to you. 11 million bits of information per second. <laughs> Some, wow. and, and I've seen the research paper that discovered that. 11 million bits of information per second, 10 million of which comes from our eyes. All right. So what this means is that a lot of the emotion part of our brain is working at an unconscious level. We're not, it, it's involuntary. This is not something we have to turn on. It's taking care of, it, it's why when you're driving a car, and all of a sudden, you quickly swerve to get out of the way of something. You didn't have to think about that. Your emotion brain was picking up information way before it was part of your conscious awareness. Well, it turns out that social situations today, some of the most nerve-wracking, dangerous situations that we're in are social situations. You know, it used to be fight or flight, blah, 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 you know, run from the, from the woolly mammoths. But if you and I were in a, in a tribe together and you saw the woolly mammoth, I could see your face. I wouldn't have to see the woolly mammoth. Right. You would telegraph to me and we would run unless I had the spear in my hand and then I'd get the spear out and we'd win the battle. Right. Um, right, right. So we have this capacity, not just to let, have this emotion system that is constantly giving us information we have a capacity to read the emotion on other people's faces. So that we have what, what are called mirror neurons that pick up on other people's emotions, and we literally catch that. So we think about emotional intelligence as information that comes from two sources, yourself and your own awareness of the situation, and the people around you and what you pick up from them. So that's part of it. But basically, emotion is information, and it is affecting your behavior constantly. If you're not aware that emotion is affecting your decisions, then you're letting emotion get in the way of your decisions. There's no such thing as making a decision unless it's a math problem 
without involving emotion. And if it's a math problem, you have to control your emotion and turn it off as best you can so that you can focus on just the logic of the math. People who can't turn off their emotion, their, their scanning, um, do really poorly on math. Yeah. Well, Kahneman, so I mean, you, you brought up Kahneman, so and his uh, system one, system two. So system one is the, you know, uh, a, a lot of the fight or flight, um, uh, woolly mammoth. I see your w eyes go wide. And so I know I'm being act, I'm activated to action kind of mm -hmm. thing. And it, and what you just said about being able to turn the emotions off and do something more logical seems to fit with his system two argument that, that I've got a, uh, I've got a, I, I've got to stop the immediate emotion and, 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 think a longer term, make some sort of plan, analyze and think through. Yes. And, um, but, but the way, the way to do that is to recognize that the emotion is there. Okay. Best. It's the best way to do it. I mean, that's what everybody recommends these days is if you, if you can say, all right, I'm going to, I know the emotion's there. I'm going to push it aside. or I'm going to, I'm going to push, push it out of the way. And so this is where emotional intelligence becomes important. It allows you to push aside the emotion that's, um, that's not constructive, or it allows you to tune into the emotion that is something like, for example, when you're in a group and you want to know what the issues are, you can just yeah. read it on people's faces. So I'm in a group, I'm picking up on some emotional current. And if I'm emotionally intelligent, uh, I can read that and rather than just letting the emotion control me, I can step back and analyze it. And is that, am I kind of, saying yeah. that right? So you would have okay. to, you know, you obviously with our analytical mind, you're going to have to make a decision given the situation that you're in, whether this is something you're going to stop and deal with at the moment or not. But if, um, you know, you get, uh, um, you know, for example, I do a lot of work with groups. I do a lot of consulting work with, with teams. And I walk in the room and I look at the faces and I can feel what's going on at any point in time. Uh, you know, and I can see certain people that are really, I can look at where they're sitting. I can look at certain faces versus others. Some people are happy to be there. Some people aren't. I can immediately see who's alienated, who's respected. I mean, here's another thing, by the way, there's a social hierarchy in every group and right. we are so fine tuned in our ability to pick up on it. We don't miss a trick. We know where we are in that social hierarchy. Okay. And, um, and so you can, you, you know, if you, if you're paying attention to it, um, you can, you can, if you bring it to your conscious awareness, you can see it getting in the way of things. You can see people shutting up, not opening their mouths to let the social hierarchy answer, you know, which is, you know, whether you're in a self-managing team or not happens. Yeah. Okay. Even in a yeah. self-managing team, there's a hierarchy. And it's the good self-managing teams that don't allow the hierarchy to control what goes on in the team. If that makes sense, I could go off on that, but you tell me what you're interested in following up on. Tell me, let, I just want to stick with the individual EI yeah. for, a, for another minute. Um, so good EI, bad EI, or, or, or maybe that's not the right way to say it. Uh, EI is, is a tool, right? I mean, in, in a sense, and it can be used for good or ill, I guess. That's, that's what I was going to try to say. Sure. So talk, uh, uh, talk about how leaders with high emotional intelligence um, – operate a little bit? Like, what is it they're doing differently than somebody who doesn't have the same level of emotional intelligence? Okay. I'll give you an example of, of a, a leader who was talking about something, a situation. So this is a, a leader, uh, one of the top leaders in an organization that I was in recently. And he was talking about how he walked into work one day and he'd had some car trouble. And he walked in with a frown on his face. And everybody kept looking at him in a fearful way, right? And he quickly realized that the frown, people were misinterpreting the frown on his face. They were worried. You know, everybody was worried about layoffs, weird things going on. He got the news about the, you know, this project that was supposed to sell. And he quickly figured that out. And he was able to say, hey, by the way, everybody, I had car trouble, uh, you know, 
just to let you know, forgive me if it seems like I'm, it's not you, it's the car trouble, right? And so, um, you know, the, the good leaders recognize that they're on stage and that they are always being read. Here's another one that good leaders are good at. Um, they're good at managing. Let me tell you, I had a leader once say to me, you know, I'm so busy and crazy. And I have these people come up to me and say, can you help me? And I'm, and I'm thinking, they got one thing on their plate and I got 30 things on their my plate. And so what's a good leader going to do? The good leader is going to say, absolutely, I can help you. You know, they're going to control their own anger at this petty little thing. <laughs> and they're going to, in a transformational leadership way, um, okay. you know, and they're going to think about the development of the individual and say, you know, I'll help you this time. Let's figure out how you can get better at doing this yourself. So, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but there's a huge link between EI and transformational leadership. It's not coming out in a lot of research. Um, so, okay. yeah. yeah. So... Uh, what about um, the bad EI, good EI, or the or the the leader using EI for good or Ill? okay? So first of all, let me say you can do that with any leadership theory, right? Anytime we teach leadership, and this is a big, you know, lots of times when I tell people I teach in a business school, well, I tell my psychology folks they feel like I've sold out. Um, I'm teaching leaders how to manipulate, right? <laughs> right. Um, but my favorite theory that talks about this is David McClelland, my um, my old. Um, mentor, uh, who uh, was my advisor on my dissertation, he basically has a theory about what he calls um, the need for influence. And uh, he calls it also the need for influence and power. And what he found in his research and his students found is that there's two, two ways leaders come at the role. Either they want influence and power for themselves, okay, um, or they want influence and power for the good of the group and the good of the cause. Okay. And so the way I like to think about it is um, I'm hoping and I'm encouraging you to embrace these, these concepts for the good of the cause. And I'm one of the things I always do with my students is I try to say, what's the cause that you're going to work toward? What is the cause that you, what are your values? What are you going to move toward? You know, self aggrandizement or anything like that is not good leadership. Right. And so that's, that's how I think about that. Okay. All right. So, but if you you could potentially be a very emotionally intelligent leader and manipulate, be really just be a really all that comes down is you're just really good at manipulating people. Yes. Yeah. All right. Same with transformational leadership. Any any leadership theory. Yeah. Sure. Okay. That's that's. Yeah. Um, so it really kind of comes down to what your goal is. So your end matters. Yes. 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 And I and I like to think that most leaders because leadership is hard work. It's really hard work. And so if you go into it, you want to lead. I think most people go into it um, with the hope of making a difference. I, I, I think so. I mean, that's my observation. Um, so, so I want to take that next level now and, and say, okay, so right. let's talk about kind of, we've talked about emotional intelligence at the individual level, but now your research has largely been around teams and the emotional intelligence resident in a team. Um, so we'll probably build a bit off, and you, we already kind of briefly mentioned, you have a, you have an HBR article with uh, Stephen Wolf um, called Building the Emotional Intelligence of Groups. And, uh, I, and I found it ungated on, on, on the web. So I'm going to hang that on the show notes when we're done. Okay, so we can great. talk about, yeah. uh, so, so folks want to look at that uh, and see a little more detail what we're talking about. They can, you can, you can grab that off the show notes. Um, so what did you, so, so you've, you, you'd been working with transformational leadership. You've been working with um, self-managing teams. How did this come together to kind of influence or help create your theory about um, the emotional intelligence resident in groups? Okay. So back to my, my idea of um, individual skills, individual abilities, not mattering all that much in a team. Um, and what really matters is whether or not the environment you create brings out the best in you. Okay. And so what I was interested in doing was creating this model. And, and this is what I had for my dissertation to begin with. And then we tweaked that model somewhat, um, was a model of the norms that allowed people to get to know one another and value one another, which brought out the best in people. 
Okay, so everyone was included. Keep in mind that these were self-managing teams we originally were studying. So it was really about knocking down the hierarchy and really using the resources in the team. And so I started doing some more digging around. And uh, one of the things that I found um, in the literature, and, and by the way, one of the most interesting things about the emotion literature right now is it's linked to, to social neuroscience, right? Okay. I got to acknowledge that this is the, the, the most fascinating piece of this is how the brain works and all this. But it turns out that whenever we go into a group environment, we have these primal social needs that need to be met. And if they're not met, our emotion, our, 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 we have uncomfortable emotion emerge. So we basically created a, a model that would enable people to be comfortable, have their social needs met so that their emotion would be um, at the service of positive outcomes in the team, right? So I'm no longer worried about not being included, not being heard, not being understood. It turns out that people thrive um, and their endorphins go off when they're in an environment where they feel understood, um, seen, felt, heard, and valued. Yeah. They literally, their endorphins go off. They want that. They crave that. So we basically help build an environment that does that with these norms. Okay. And that's, that's the emotionally intelligent environment. So an emotionally intelligent environment brings out the best views people as emotional beings. So there's a little bit of leap in, lo in logic there, um, but that's how we argue it. So let's talk a little bit about some of the specifics that you covered in, in, the, um, uh, in the article. So you said you had norms that create awareness of emotions and then norms that help regulate emotions. You had kind of two categories of norms. Mm -hmm. And then, so within the norms that create a, awareness of emotions, you you were just talking a little bit about, you know, uh, one of them you have listed is interpersonal understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so you were, that's the that piece where you, I think, where you were just talking about where, like, if I feel listened to and heard, then I'm going to feel more comfortable. Is that? Yes. Yes. And then the perspective taking uh, was the other piece there. What's that about? And why is that important for the... Uh, at the individual level. Okay, so first of all, I have to tell you that we the that paper obviously was 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 written in two thousand and one, and it's kind of evolved okay. since then. Okay, sure. Um, but so so let me see. I'm going to try to answer your question through the evolution. Um, even better if you can. If yeah, can, if you can give me the updated version. Can, that's that's even better. Okay. Sure. So um, awareness of emotion is really awareness of individuals and people. Um, and it's that turns out that that interpersonal understanding, as we went off and studied it in many different organizations, becomes really, really important in teams. It was most strongly linked to performance of anything we studied in teams, which piqued our curiosity. And so interpersonal understanding is awareness of what excites that person, what they're good at who they are, um, who they are underneath it all, um, and not, you know, their initial presentation, right? So when you take time to really get to know that person, that emotional being as who they are, it begins to create that sense of, of, of acceptance of who I am. I can be myself here, right? Yeah. And so that awareness. So we had three, I think we ended up in the end with three, statistically two, we looked at this statistically, in that awareness of emotion piece, we have um, interpersonal understanding, um, confronting members who break norms, and caring behavior. <laughs> Those three were the three that statistically fell in there. Um, yeah. I think perspective taking was in managing emotion, was it? So you had uh, perspective taking as uh, norms that create awareness of emotions, and then you had confronting and caring as norms that help regulate emotions. Okay, so it turns out that they don't, statistically, they don't fit in this awareness um, um, and regulation um, clumps. You know, they factor analyze into individual level, team level, external level. 
So okay. um, interpersonal understanding, confronting, and caring are one individual level of thing. Team self-evaluation, um, and we no longer, seeking feedback fell out. It was completely team self-evaluation and seeking feedback were one and the same. Um, creating resources for working with emotion, and I think proactive problem solving is underneath that. Those, those link together, although proactive problem solving also somewhat links to the external. Oh, and creating an affirmative environment. Yeah. Um, yeah, optimism. We now call that optimism. Um, those, those link together. And then the final one is um, the external boundary. So that's how we talk about them now. Um, okay. So the columns still kind of stand, but it seems sounds like you've kind of mixed the the rows, if you will. Yeah, I don't really. I no longer think about them as being um, awareness and regulation. That's interesting. Thank you for reminding me of that. Maybe I should be. Maybe at least I should be remembering where anybody who reads the article. They need to know that they, that's what they're thinking. <laughs> well, by the way, so, the article's been republished four times in books by HBR. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a huge seller for them. <laughs> People like yeah, their- yeah. It's been and it, it's been cited more than a thousand times. So it's a it's had a lot of influence in the field. It has. It's of- been cited by a lot. Of, yeah, I get a lot of requests for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. So some some of this stuff that kind of so you were still thinking, um, individual level. We've got norms. So for example, norms of confronting, right? So that's a tough one, right? I think most groups, most, you know, most people don't like doing that. Right. So right. how do you create, and, and a lot of times when it happens, people get very defensive. So how does a, how does a effective team deal with that then? Brilliant question, Mark. Brilliant question. So let me say this. First of all, I took a lot of flack for calling that confronting. A lot of people got really upset with me because it was as if I was advocating for people to be rude to one another. But in my original research, which had been done on the shop floor, the norm in was really confrontational. People would just, they knew each other so well that they, um, that they, but then they were softer for some people, a little bit harder, but the idea was you didn't let this stuff pass. You know, if somebody broke an informal rule, you didn't. And in the in the not so good teams, over and over, you know, I heard, well, I don't want to disturb them. I don't. So, um, so we we I, I kept it in there and I fought for it. Eventually, we changed the terminology. And let me let me see if I can find what we're calling it now because I've been writing about it and I should have it. Okay, here it is. We now call it addressing unhelpful behavior. Okay. <laughs> but we did. Wow. Steve and I did a, a really good study of it, and what we found was that you really had to have in, uh, interpersonal understanding well honed in order to be able to do the confrontation. So you yeah. had to tailor essentially. You had to tailor the confrontation to the individual. Okay, so this is what I'm teaching teams now. I'm saying what you do is up front. You clarify what's unhelpful behavior in this team. And you'd say, okay, well, showing up late is unhelpful. Not doing the work you said you were going to do is unhelpful. Cutting people off is unhelpful. Looking at your cell phone during the middle of a meeting is unhelpful. They list it all, and you, you know, you're going to constantly amend this. Um, and, and then you figure out a way you're going to confront people. And, you know, it usually begins with a new team where you take someone aside and you say it. But eventually in the great teams – People get confronted right in the team. And, and so that's, that's the way I'm thinking about it now. I can tell you that there's nothing that ticks people off more than the unfairness of not confronting people when they break norms. Fair behavior, by the way, treating people fairly suggests that they're valued. So let's come back to this social need. I mean, this is literature. This is all in, in, the, in the psychology literature. That the importance of fairness, even animals know when they haven't been treated fairly. Okay? And yeah. it's, a hu- it's, it's, it's atavistic. It's primal. And um, what we now know is that when you are treated unfairly, you don't feel valued. And so this is an important norm. You need to be, be basically give people a heads up ahead of time and say, we're going to call you out if you do this. And then you need to treat people fairly. 
there's a, there's a, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know the um, experimental economics literature uh, as well as I probably should, but I know that they're, they're in the experimental economics literature. They've done um, they've done games with you know uh, that uh, where people um, got treated unfairly, and then they um, and in the next round they were willing to sacrifice like higher payoffs for themselves to punish the people who treated them unfairly. Yes. Um, so even though they wound up with less, um, it seems to be rap- They're all into punishment. Yeah. yeah. That's what you get. You get retribution. <laughs> it's all about retribution when you're treated on. Right. I mean, it's real yeah, so, affront. Yeah. It's a major affront to a social need, and your social need is to feel valued. Your is to feel like you matter. The label that uh, is used in the literature now that I've been using lately is you want to feel like you belong, that you matter to this team. People are going to care for you. You're in an environment where we care for one another, and we have each other's backs. People thrive in those kind of environments. So when you talk about norms, how much of those norms are uh, emergent, uh, meaning they come as a result of the uh, repeated interaction within a team, and how much of them are formal and instituted uh, in your in your research? Great, great. You, you, you're so smart. <laughs> These are great questions. It's fun talking to you. Um, Mostly because I sat in your class and listened to you talk about so this. Maybe. So. <laughs> but actually, I'm drawing. I, but what's interesting about this, I just want to, is, and I don't know if you're familiar with the institutional economics literature at all. Oh, really? um, but there's a, yeah. So there's a. I mean, so that's that was actually a big area of my study back when I, uh, when I was doing my PhD. And so hearing a lot of this, a lot of this discussion about yeah. norms and emergence yeah. is a, is a big theme in that literature. Sure. So it's just kind it's of interesting. Awesome. Interesting. I'm going to have to write that down and take a look at it. I have looked a lot of game theory and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think you might like, uh, Doug North's work. I'll send you, uh, great. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. He's got, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, let me okay. let's let's hear your version of it though. All right, so, <laughs> so emergent norms versus formal yeah. imposed norms. Yeah, yeah. So we we actually d- 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 uh, think about them as descriptive or prescript prescriptive norms, right? So you're, are we just describing what has emerged, or are we prescribing what what you're going to be? So um, first of all, norms always emerge. Behavior is never random in a group. Um, at the very first meeting, we know important norms emerge, um, but we also know that norms can be prescribed. You can change, you can manage a team's culture by intentionally um, uh, defining and supporting specific norms, reinforcing certain norms. And so a lot of um, great leaders know this. They, they, norms come from values and they, they, they call out behavior that's inconsistent with the norms. Okay. And so they define carefully. This is the intervention that I that I most teach for for team leaders, which is to come up with a set of norms. You know, and I offer my norms from my research, and um, but I also say, you know, you got to pick norms that work for you, that work in your environment. But but the idea is that you want to enforce them and you want to you know reinforce them. Um, it, so it's not my idea. Basically, what we're now learning, a couple things. Well, let me let me step back before I say that. Um, Norms come from the top down. They're not egalitarian. People with power define the norms. So if I look at my undergraduate groups, I look at the kids with the greater status in the team. They're the ones that primarily, unless someone intervenes around them, they will um, they will define the norms. And I saw this a lot in my original work when I lived for two months in that organization. And in many of the really lousy self-managing work teams, the people with the status to define the norms were people who were bullies or, you know, not, did not have, um, you know, moral high ground, um, were not egalitarian, didn't care about anybody but themselves. Um, So anyway, um, and a lot of norms um, just emerge and nobody realizes how powerful they are until you tell people, like, let me give you one norm that, that I talk a lot, of, a, a lot about because it was a powerful intervention that I created in a, in a team once. When people pick up their phones to check their, their texts in the middle of a meeting, like I'm doing right now to you. Yeah. Vanessa's showing me her phone. Yeah. <laughs> 
because this is going to be audio. <laughs> okay. They they don't do that indiscriminately. They only do that when certain people are talking. All right. So the status hierarchy, it's the higher people in the status. You'd never do that for people who are high in the status hierarchy, however it's different. You only do that when people who are lower in the status hierarchy start to talk. All right. But the norm is you can pick up your phone. Um, so who sets those norms? It's always the powerful. They don't even notice it. They don't even notice people. So if you would say, hey, people pick up the pick up the phone in your team, people in the higher status say, no, they don't. They do not. Because because they don't when this high status person is right. talking. <laughs> right. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> and, it's, and this is the kind of stuff that creates problems in a team. So what we now know from research is that people that are treated as if they don't matter, they don't belong, they're not part of the one that's cared for, they have really bad remedial behavior. They lose control of their emotions. All right. And people always say to me, but you mean you just have to take it? You can't fight back when people treat you like that? You just have to take it. Unfortunately, when you fight back, it doesn't help unless, unless someone with high status signals to the group that they want you in. It's a fascinating line of research. You have no idea. And so yeah. um, it's, it's fascinating. But you, so anyway, what I, what I advocate is getting, getting to know one another, creating norms that are quite clear, uh, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You get the rest, right? Yeah. You know, it's interesting hearing you talk about the getting to know each other. So one of the projects I've been working on for the last couple of years is, um, and I think I've probably told you about this, is I've been interviewing um, former military leaders who were leaders in the healthcare, the military health system, who retire from the military. So with the idea that, you know, they're, they've spent 20 plus years in the military in that system. So they're, they're, pretty institutionalized. Mm -hmm. uh, and they leave that system, uh, retire and go to become a, a leader in a non, non-military civilian healthcare system sure. someplace. Sure. So not associated with the federal government. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and one of the most common things they talk about is this getting to know your uh, employees and getting to know the people. It, it is a really profound norm in the military that leaders know their soldiers, sailors, whatever, uh, airmen, Marines. Um, and if you don't, if you don't know their children's names and how old they are, and I mean, just a lot of stuff, yeah. you know, um, you know, that's a, that's a norm in the military. And if you don't know that stuff, you're a bad leader in the military. Sure, sure. Um, you know, and you come out into the civilian and these folks come out into the civilian market and they're just, they're just kind of taken aback yeah. because that's not actually acceptable. Like you can't, you know, like a couple of them are like, I can't even legally ask people some of those questions, you know? Yes. Uh, yes. And, and so that's one of the things that they, they really struggle with is that, you know, um, the intimacy that leadership had in the military versus what it has in the civilian environment. And it probably varies from, you know, and there's probably different ways of getting that information and so forth, I imagine. But it's a, it, that was triggering as you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's fascinating. That. I never heard that about the military, but it makes sense to me. I mean, whenever I have students who've been in the military in my MBA classes, they are so, po so powerfully positive around that kind of issue about getting students, getting to know one another, the community. Cause I always try to build a community in my class and um, it's so much easier when there's a military person in there who's part of that. Mm, interesting. Yeah, people, yeah. Someone's had a leadership role before. Uh, it, and it's a norm, right? So that's a, like, like yeah. getting to know each other. And it's really interesting that, you, and so that's an important norm for, for your, for your model. Then, it's to, critical. To, it is the most important because and be, I, I just come back to the social need of, of people wanting to be known, wanting to belong, you know, belonging. People don't really understand that the belonging, I mean, the opposite of belonging is being rejected or excluded or ostracized. And people really get that. Nobody wants that. But you know, there's long, they're actually two different, two different things, but they're strongly related. Um, you know, when you, when you don't feel like you belong, you're always on the edge. You're always on the edge of feeling excluded. Yeah. Yeah. 
and as as social animals, as you know, going back to your woolly mammoth example, I mean, there's a fair amount of evolutionary psychology, you know, discussion of why, you know, what distinguishes Homo sapiens from, you know, uh, whatever the I, I'm this, I'm a little outside my field here, but you know, prior generations of you know uh, uh, prehumans is that is that um, our 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 brain size increased in order to process the however many, was it eleven million signals per right, right, right. second yeah, or yeah, something, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. right? It was precisely to be able to handle that social that that complex social data that's constantly coming in. Yes. And it's what enables us to behave in more effective ways than our predecessors yes, did. Yes, indeed. It's required. It's, it, it, it enables us to pass our genes on, but it also enables us, our communities to be stronger. So that we pass our genes on. So it's, right. we, we, we maintain our belonging in, in the, in, uh, because if we were kicked out of the tribe, we were dead. We couldn't pass our genes on. And, right. um, it makes a stronger community that can go on and, and, and survive as well. Blah, 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 yeah. blah. But, to, but to be rejected or to be pushed down the hierarchy has a direct oh. impact, right? That, that base brainstem level kind of fear gets triggered, right? It is really bad. It, it, I mean, it's, it's like physical pain. I mean, the, the brain lights up in the same place as physical pain does. And if you feel rejected, oh. you know what, what helps it? Take two Tylenol. <laughs> Does it really? It does that really? It reduces your oh feeling. <laughs> it reduces your feeling badly about yourself. All right, I'm gonna prescribe that to my social pain. Yeah, I prescribe that for heartache. Uh, I yeah, guess. For heartache. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, in your in your paper, um, or it's a chapter actually, with uh, Wolf, Komen, and Messer, you take this idea of emotionally competent groups and their norms Mm -hmm. that build social capital, Mm -hmm. which then builds a task focused, task focused processes, which then leads to team effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that kind of construct a little bit? Is that something you're still working with? And is that still valid? Because I know this is also like 15 years old too, but. Yeah, it is. I'm thinking about it a little bit differently now, but yeah, absolutely. So um, the way I think about it these days is that, we're asking a lot more of our teams and we can even, well, let's talk about, um, for example, let's, let's bring up in a healthcare setting teams in a hospital. Mm. Okay. Great. So we ask, we're really asking a lot, much more of teams than we ever have in the past in the sense of that what they're, the information that they have available to them is, is, um, uh, much larger, you know, to, there's information overload um, and um, the, the problems are more comp- complex than they've ever been. Um, and there's so much information, it's much more difficult for individuals to make decisions without a team. All right. So I'm assuming, and this has been my assumption of the medical environment, that if you've got good people around you helping you make a decision, whether it's a team of doctors and nurses, et cetera, et cetera, helping you, we're all looking at different pieces of information that matter. I mean, we now, the problems and the analysis and the weaving in and out of all this information is, is much more complex than it used to be. Um, the dilemma is that Coming back to the economics literature, people are wary of teams. Teams are threatening. Oh, okay. Teams can be threatening because you have this idea that you can be excluded. Okay. Huge literature in the psychology literature about um, people not sharing their information these days, not sharing everything they know for fear of stepping on people's toes for fear of, for many different reasons, you know, one of the reasons why psychological safety is so important these days in all these environments is that despite the fact that they need this information more than ever, the world in teams is very scary with all these different hierarchies, right? Besides the fact that a lot of the information that I have, if I share it with you, it's no longer mine. Okay. If I could just tell you, I mean, there is this fascinating paper about how much information people will actually share. And the people are so smart, they only share as much as everybody else is sharing. 
and no more. The level at which everybody else is sharing, because your information is your power. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of situations where we're asking a lot of people, but there are tripwires. You can step on the doctor's toes and say something to get you in trouble. Right. We all know this. So you can form with what the doctor, the hierarchy, you could lose your job if you um, or your ability to be in the emergency room if you're not following orders by these doctors. You could share all your good information and then the other nurses or the others could have it. And then they've got what you've got, your secret way of doing this or that, right? And so there's a lot of disincentive. Uh, you know, it's being part of a team is what we call a mixed motive task, right? Okay. Come back to the... And so my argument, the argument that I'm making now is that you have to create an environment where people feel like they belong and they're part of something important and that they have some control over the environment in order to get them to fully embrace the task at hand and to give more, the more pro-social, more pro-social information. So they're not thinking selfishly, they're thinking pro-socially. So coming to the task behavior, if you want people to really give to the task, don't be naive and assume they're just going to do it without creating an environment that's conducive to this. Is that making sense? I know I'm kind of it does, yeah. explaining this. So these norms. So how do we create these norms that right? Because it comes back to the norms. It comes back to the norms um, where you create everybody's feeling feeling um, you know like they they are respected and part of the whole. Right? We, we can talk about the specifics there if you want, but um, which um, gets them out of their self focused or their fear. Right? Makes them feel more psychologically safe. And gets them to then contribute their best information, their best ideas, because they're part of something, and they contribute more to the task, right? And then that makes if you see, yeah. So if you see, if you see hanging on to information as a self-protective measure, then that um, then that psychological safety is really important, right? So because you're not going to let go of all of your information if that disarms you. Yes, and let me tell you that. I'd been reading about this for years in the psychology literature, in the economics literature. Um, but until I got out there and started consulting with teams, I had, I had no idea how bad it was out there. So in terms of people holding on, not sharing stuff, and it's really both out of fear and out of um, being strategic. So the fear is I have to maintain my power so it is often fear. I've either, either either I don't want to step on someone's sh shoes, or I, I lose my my status, or I lose my job, or and I also have to maintain my power. And so there's a lot of um, of um, partial in, very smart getting in there. Hey, I, I contribute just as much as everyone else. I know how to do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's yeah. Um, feigning, feigning is what I call it now in my writing. They're feigning contributions. Um, and they're doing as much as everybody else. And they're saying the right thing and they're doing the right thing and they're saving their butts. They're saving their jobs, you know, um, and but they're not really in there giving their whole. And so what I found is that if I can do interventions with these teams, and it's talked about in the it's talked about in the like one of my favorite books that recently came out. Oh, I don't think I have it here. Uh, is about a, a, a team coach that it's called the trillion dollar coach. Okay. Have you heard of it? I have not. Okay. Team coach that worked with Steve Jobs. He worked with Apple, Microsoft. They call him the trillion dollar coach because he coached the teams for all these great leaders. And what he did was he built, what they're saying is that, we, I mean, we all know Steve Jobs was a jerk, right? If he hadn't right. had a coach coaching his team, making everybody feel like they were belonging, getting people out of there, out, getting people out of being selfish and not worried about conforming, they never would have created the great things that they did. Wow. Yeah. And he, this coach argued that you have coaches for individuals, you know, you have coaches for sports teams. What makes you think you don't need a coach in a, in a in a, a company. And my argument is you don't necessarily need a coach. You need a leader who thinks of themselves as a coach and who uh -huh. creates the environment that enables people to be this way, right? Blah, blah, blah. 
So is that, okay, am I, I, you immediately made me think, are you coming back to your self-managing teams idea then? Is that, because that's what that sounds like. That sounds oh, like. Of like some, you have to let go of a lot of control. You have to still be in control. You have to recognize your control as a leader. So you, but you yeah. have to, um, and you have to enforce the norms, but you have to let the team help you know what the norms are that need to be created, Right. Um, because you don't see them because nobody picks up the phone when you're, when you're talking. Right. So you let them, you help them, let them tell you what's needed and you continually tweak it right with this team self-evaluation continually. And, and you help them feel, um, and you give them a lot of control, but you know, you still have to be there ready to, um, be the leader when you need it. Uh, Yeah. I, I, I'm not a huge proponent of self-managing teams anymore. Oh, okay. What I'm a okay. proponent of is 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 leaders who give up control, you know, who, who are willing to give up control and step in only when the team needs them, and behave more like a trillion dollar coach. Behave like is a that... trillion dollar coach. Behave like a transformational leader, um, okay. and not be overly controlling. Yeah, which is hard for doctors. Okay, so we've been so let's let's uh, kind of uh, uh, I wanted to make that kind of final leap. Um, uh, I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years uh, because uh, we've both been involved with the New Hampshire Physician Leadership Development Program that's being run at, at UNH out of the Paul College. Um, and so you uh, and I got to watch you uh, teach a number of, of seminars to a group of physicians who um, were coming to learn leadership skills so that they could you know, move from clinician to clinician leader. Um, so what have you learned um, uh, about, you know, like physicians and their, um, and the healthcare system through that experience um, uh, and what kind of leadership they need uh, sure. to learn? Sure, 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 sure. So well, let me first say that the, the, the group that, we're, that we're, we're working with is a self-selected group. So these are people who want to move into leadership or are, are being encouraged. And so they're already a group of people who are not, I think, so hard to work with. Um, but I've heard horror stories. That, you know, one of the things we know, and this has been true, I've worked with a lot of engineers, a lot of, um, but there are certain um, jobs I mean, to become a doctor, you have to do so well on cognitive tasks that you have not honed your emotional intelligence, right? Um, you haven't had to hone your emotional intelligence and your, your ability to, to, um, to empathize. And, you know, um, and I think that the system, the system, just like it does for law- lawyers, I've also worked with lawyers and lawyers are really uh, hard to work with. Um, because they're they're re- rewarded um, for being better than other people, right? To good judgment skills. Um, so um, anyway, this group that we've been working with, they really get they really get it. So one of the pleasures of working with them is how smart they are. If you give them an argument, they get it. And and they're motivated to want to take it on and learn it, and like no other group I've ever I've ever worked with. Um, so first of all, I want to say that the dilemma is that they're taught, and 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 it's our it's our friend, um, it's our mutual buddy. What's his name? Neil Neil Meehan, who who told me this, and so this is I know this from Neil. They're trained to make to to know that that, that they are the person who stands between death and life. They have to be the decision maker. They, they cannot shirk their responsibility. They have to know what matters. And so they have a hard time letting go of control. And they're trained that way. And they're rewarded for that, right, as they're, as they're developing. So to me, the biggest challenge is not their motivation to want to do it with this group or their ability to get it or to be necessarily emotionally intelligent for this group, but it's the willingness to let go of control let in the information from the team, right? So where have they shown hesitancy to, to let in the team? So I've been working with them to examine the norms in their teams. You know, all, all these folks have are, are leaders and they take the model with the norms and they go and they assess their, the norms and they come back. And, you know, some of the norms are things like, 
um, um, a team self-evaluation or, you know, allowing the team to have a little more control than the leader has. Right. Um, and they come back with a read on the norm, which is more them in control than the, than the, um, than the team members being in control. You know, it's a very hierarchical environment. Yeah. And their training perpetuates that. Right. Yeah. And it's exactly the kind of environment that needs people to be rewarded for speaking their mind. Right. Right. I mean, I've, you know, and we have, we, I, I speak as if I was still in healthcare. Um, I mean, the, there, we are trying um, in healthcare. I know we are trying to create better opportunities for people to speak up, particularly in, you know, um, you know, pre-surgical situations, every, they, they, we have a, you know, they now have a formal uh, timeout where they, you know, everybody has to agree that this is the patient and this is the thing we're doing and which sounds a bit silly, but you know, there's a real problem with wrong site surgeries and, and all those kinds of uh, those kinds of things. And it, you know, when you are a patient in that situation, it seems like they're playing some sort of game, but it really is a, um, it's it's meant to be a norm that allows people to speak. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I think it's really so powerful. A, I think it's really positive. Yeah. yeah, I think that's working really well. well. Yeah, I would say. Although I I just had some interesting experiences with my dad in a hospital, and um, you know my eighty nine year old dad has recently had surgery and has been in and out of hospitals, and it's been fascinating to be um, a fly on the wall while these things are going on. Yeah. Especially now that you've seen and uh, interacted with with the, these leaders, yeah, not not with the hospital that we've been working. Not this is he. he he's uh, no, no, right, right, yeah. different hospital. Yeah, and to see but, the hierarchy at play, to see the hierarchy yeah, and yeah. the and just the, the whole all, all the way on down. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, I'm curious. to wrap up uh, to and, and now to just wrap up our our chat. Um, where are you going now with your research? What what's the most exciting thing you're working on? Well, at the moment, I am trying to get a lot of writing done. So we've collected a lot of data, and I have been um, seduced uh, to go out and do a lot of consulting work. Um, so what happened is that we created this survey to collect data with, and then all of a sudden we were asked to use it in companies. And then all of a sudden people started inviting me in and using the survey. And, and so I've had this great pleasure to take all the skills that I've built over the years um, and, and to be working with teams. But it's completely distracted me from um, publishing all the research. I mean, we, you know, you had to dig pretty far back to find my published articles, right? Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment, I'm writing things up. So I've, been yeah. I've got like four or five articles all in play and I'm writing a book at the same time. And the book basically looks at my experience and my um, with working with teams and the theory, comparing the theory to the experience. And, and I, I don't have the, the, I've been invited to do a book. So, which is the great thing. And I, I don't want before that invitation kind of invitation runs out. I want to get the book done. So that's kind of where I'm at. And it's very exciting to be able to write a book because I don't have to worry about reviewers, you know? <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> you get to have your opinions. <laughs> I get to have my opinions. I just get to ramble on and on and on, like talk, like I'm talking with you, you know. <laughs> um, and that, so that's fun. But I also really need to get those articles out. Otherwise, I'll, yeah. you know, for the career. Yeah. Like that is, oh, I, I know you do. Yeah. I feel you. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been great fun for me too, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. I'll see you soon. I hope. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community and we'll talk with you again soon.